So not quite the ending I was hoping for for the end of the first track day back, especially having done all that work to get the car to where it is today. That being said, I've gone through the data and the apps I was using and I'm pretty sure I know exactly what went wrong, so at least there's a lesson to be learned. The damage is pretty centered around the front bumper and it is fixable. It's just gonna be an absolute ton of work to get it right. And at least it gives me an opportunity to do some stuff better than I did it the first time around. So before I do show you the damage though, I do wanna say a big thank you to the whole team at Croft and Javelin. It was a pretty minor incident in the end. It didn't really affect anyone, but they had a great attitude and we really appreciate that. So let's have a look at this new JDM look I've got. So at the front, we can see a crack straight down the center. We've got this mark where it hit a tire wall of some kind. We've got under the light here, a lot of the filler is cracked right along there. PPF's holding the whole thing together. The quick release got ripped out and around here is where we've got the worst of it. You can see it's just been absolutely destroyed, ripped apart. I'm probably gonna have to cut a section of that out Put it back in, I don't know. But either way, it's going to be a lot of fiberglass in to try and fix that. If we come around this side, though, we can see the real shocker. So all of this was filler because the kit I got, like I said in the kit video when I did the walk around, it just had some massive gaps. And I really didn't know what I was doing with fiberglass at the time. Now, a lot more confident. I'm going to have to build that up. I'm going to have a little bit of filler to even it out. But really, that whole section has got to come out. And that's my opportunity to do it better than the first time I did this. Now, there could be even more damage that I've either forgotten about or I never even knew about because when the, someone hands you a bumper back to a damaged car, you just want to see if it actually still fits on and take a look at that. So I'm going to get the car turned around in the garage, bumper off, take a look underneath it as well. Make sure there's no, you know, no con bent control arms. The car was spinning after all. I have found a little coolant leak. So uh, a little puddle over here to deal with. Apparently it's quite small, so hopefully that's just an overpressurized system. Maybe it's a loose clamp. That would be quite a nice fix. And one fun thing though is the battery has died. So now I've got to turn this thing around by hand. Under here we can see everything's had a pretty good coating of whatever was on the infield. There's lots of bits of dirt and mud under here, but Nothing too concerning. These control arms in blue, these are the things I was worried about the most. None of them seem loose or bent, so I think we're in pretty good condition here. Um, nothing else seems to be awry. So let's check the other side. So it seems to be the same story on this side. However, there is something wrong because that shouldn't squeak. I'm hoping that's just a piece of debris between the brake disc and the brake pad if so that's just a case of taking them out cleaning them out and putting them back in but we'll have to wait and see hopefully it's not some kind of intense rebuild having finished the underside investigation i am now confident there's no further damage the squeak from the rear wheel was actually just some stone stuck behind the brake disc and the brake disc guard so with those knocked out no more squeak don't need to take the caliper apart very happy about that so now it means we know it's just a bumper so let me show you how i'm planning to fix that so I've just noticed that my front splitter quick release kit, the red things there and there, uh, one of them's bent. So I need to bend that back and I haven't even got to the point of building a splitter for that yet. So fantastic. Now back to the bumper. This is obviously gonna need a respray. And one of the first things I'm gonna do is peel off PPF in order to start working on it. And it's probably only in one piece still because of the PPF. So I'm very glad I did that job. But as I mentioned before, I can do this better than I did last time. And if you look at the symmetry on the he around the headlights, well, this is how much filler was needed to make that happen. Quite a lot. Now, I want to do that in fiberglass. I don't want to have to try and do it all from guesswork again. So I'm going to peel the PPF off to about there, work on that in fiberglass so it matches the other side, then peel this one off to there, make sure that this one matches the new one on this side so I can keep that good look of symmetry and it fits the car well. Then I'll take off the center section and I'll work on these areas. The big question then, why did I suddenly start spinning at almost 100 miles an hour? It's a combination of fatigue and not factoring in higher speeds, also known as running out of talents. So there's clearly some work for me to do on myself as well as a car. Looking at the data though, it's clear there's one thing I wasn't lacking in, commitment. I use Race Chrono to log data when I'm on track that I can review after the fact and learn from it, 
And what we can see is I was still fully sending it 50 minutes into that last session. And that's actually when I set my fastest lap of the day. 58 minutes or so it went wrong, but at 50 minutes it was going great. But what happened between those two laps to make it go from my best lap to my worst lap? Well, there was one corner that all day long I knew I, I just couldn't get it right. Um, I'd had an education, I'd learned the technique, I just couldn't put it into practice. Now on my fastest lap, which I didn't know at the time because I don't have any timing equipment in the car, but I knew it felt quick. So I thought, I thought that was a good lap and I thought I can do it better if I just get that corner right. So I focused really all my attention on that corner and I did and I got round it and I was carrying a lot more speed, which I should have factored in, didn't. And then as you get onto, it's not really a straight a croft, but it's sort of three straights combined. You pretty much go flat out in the MR2. You just need to lift at one point. I was a bit further round. The car was a bit more rotated and the wheels weren't quite as straight as I, or they had been on previous laps when I lifted at just the wrong time. And then I went on a lift off oversteer tour of the infield. So the lesson learned is to take plenty of breaks. It's a pretty easy one to follow and I certainly will be. So it's going to be a few weeks as well before this is ready for track. So I'll be coming back to it pretty fresh. I'll probably start with 20 minute sessions and build up from there. Ultimately, I'm very glad I built this car to the safety standard I have. The cage, the harnesses, the seats, the helmet I wear, the suit I wear, everything I use is FIA approved. I'm not actually in a race series, as you know, but that standard exists for a reason. And ultimately, all those elements combined could save your life. There's a few more things I want to do to the car as well. I want to plumb in the fire suppression system and the electrical cutoff because this car could one day be on fire. I hope it's not, but if it is, I want to be able to save myself and the car. And in the meantime, I'm going to focus on just getting it roadworthy and getting this bumper done. So thank you very much for watching. A thumbs up for safety on track would be very much appreciated. And we'll see you soon.